everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Phillips, and I'm the Head of Health and Social Care at Policy Exchange. Uh, it's a great privilege um, to welcome you all here today, and indeed to welcome uh, the Minister for Primary Care and Public Health, Neil O'Brien, to deliver a keynote address which is entitled Achieving Smoke-Free 2030, Cutting Smoking and Stopping Kids Vaping. Now, the Minister will deliver remarks for about 20, 25 minutes or so before we turn to roughly 20 minutes uh, of questions, both from those of you joining us here um, in the room and also our online audience, which I'm pleased to say is uh, large today. So I would encourage you to start formulating uh, your comments uh, into questions uh, from now, and we'll hope to be able to turn to uh, as many, many of you as, as possible when we do have that Q&A uh, section. So um, if you would please all join me in welcoming uh, the Minister. Well, I, I can honestly say it's a huge um, pleasure to be back at uh, Policy Exchange. Um, so much has changed since I was the director here. The battered seats have just about survived. Um, but Policy Exchange has gone on from strength to strength, really. I'm not saying that you could draw a line at the point where I left, and it's all been uphill since there, but it certainly is having a very, very good run. I'm very pleased to see that Julia is still here um, as well. So it's a huge pleasure to, to talk to you today about um, vaping and smoking and our next steps um, forward. Everybody agrees that more needs to be done to uh, not just treat ill health, but to uh, prevent it in the first place. And cutting smoking is one of the most evidence-based and effective interventions that we can make to that end. And that's why in 2019, the government set the bold ambition uh, for England to be smoke-free by 2030, meaning reducing smoking rates to 5% or less. Now, everybody knows about the health impact of smoking. It's still sadly, the biggest preventable cause of illness and death in England. Uh, up to two out of three lifelong smokers uh, will die from smoking. And cigarettes are the only product which, if used correctly, will kill you. And the positive impact of stopping smoking is immediate. For those who quit, after just a few weeks, lung function increases by up to 10% uh, and circulation improves. And after <coughs> one year, just one year, the risk of a heart attack is half of that of a smoker. So the benefits of stopping smoking are immediate. The person who quits today is the person who isn't in a hospital bed uh, next year. So cutting smoking will help us hit the fourth of the PM's five priorities to cut waiting lists. But as well as the health impact, uh, the economic impact of smoking is also huge. Uh, and in the excellent 2010 Pulse Exchange paper Cough Up, it noted that it is a popular myth that smoking is a net contributor to the economy, quite right. In fact, new analysis from ASH uh, on the cost of smoking in the UK in 2022 found that smoking has a 21 billion total cost to the public purse. Uh, to talk you through that, people used to argue that though there was a cost to the NHS from smoking, the tax was paid offset this. But that ignores the fact that smokers are more likely than non-smokers to become sick and to be out of work and more likely to stay unwell for longer. In fact, smokers are absent for an average of 2.7 days per year more than non-smokers. So reducing smoking rates not only improves health outcomes and reduces the burden on the NHS, but it also boosts productivity and economic growth too. Current smokers are 7.5% less likely to be employed compared to never smokers, and ex-smokers are 5% more likely to be employed than current smokers. So in places like Birmingham, an additional 6,000 people are out of work because of smoking, and quitting could help to put that right. And as well as the productivity impact, uh, quitting smoking saves the average person about £2,000 a year. So in poorer parts of the country, going smoke-free could mean far more money circulating in the local economy. So a positive productivity benefit and also savings to individuals, a huge, powerful way to level up by cutting smoking. So today, as well as talking about tackling smoking, I want to start to address a, a new threat, uh, the growth of vaping among children. There's been a very sharp increase in children vaping, particularly disposable vapes. NHS figures for 2021 showed that 9% of 11 to 15-year-old children used e-cigarettes, up from 6% in 2018. And that is a rapidly rising trend that we need to stop. Whether it's disposable vapes marketed to kids with bright colours, or low prices, or cartoon characters, or child-friendly flavours, or indeed products being sold that just don't meet our rules on content. Today, we step up our efforts to stop kids from getting hooked on vaping. And my message is this. 
if your business plan relies on getting kids hooked on nicotine, we are coming for you. So today I will set out what we'll do to stop children and non-smokers from starting vaping, how we will exploit the potential of vaping as a powerful tool to stop people smoking, and how we will help more people quit smoking, particularly where rates are highest. And I'd like to thank Javid Khan for his independent review, which has helped inform many of our uh, next steps. I'd also like to thank Bob Blackman and his role as the chair of the All Party uh, Parliamentary Group on Smoking and Health, who's been a hugely important advocate uh, for keeping smoking on the public health agenda. Let me start with vaping. Uh, we need to do two things. On the one hand, stop children uh, taking up vaping. On the other, exploit the huge potential of vaping to help adult smokers to quit. Uh, NHS figures, as I mentioned, showed that 9% of 11 to 15-year-old children had used e-cigarettes in 2021, and that is a rising trend. Dr Mike McKean, the President of Policy for the Royal College of Paediatricians and Child Health, has estimated that prevalence may well now be even higher. And I think many of us as parents are very worried about our kids' health and about them getting addicted to nicotine. Uh, the Chief Medical Officer, and please say he's here today, has also raised his concerns about children vaping. And I'd also pay tribute to Caroline Johnson, my colleague, for highlighting this issue and what might be done about it. And that's why today, as part of work on stopping people starting smoking and vaping, we are opening a specific call for evidence on youth vaping to identify opportunities to reduce the number of children accessing and using vape products and explore where the government can go further. We will look at where we can go beyond the EU Tobacco Products Directive and what that allowed us to do as well. This will explore a huge range of issues, including how we ensure regulatory compliance, uh, look at the appearance and characteristic of vapes, about their marketing and promotion, about the role of social media, obviously now uh, crucial. It will also seek to better understand the vape market, looking at issues such as the price of the low-cost products and disposables. We're also looking closely and working closely uh, with colleagues from the Department of uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs to consider the environmental impact of vapes, particularly disposable vapes, which have become so appealing to young people. In 2022, 52% uh, of young people who vaped were using disposable products compared to just 8% in 2021, so from 8% to 52% in just one year. Over 1.3 million disposable vapes are thrown away each week and that accumulates to about 10 tonnes of lithium a year, equivalent to the lithium batteries of a staggering 1,200 electric vehicles. And so the call for evidence will be open for the next eight weeks, and we hope that everyone concerned will take this opportunity to share their views and help shape our future approach, particularly our young people. We're already taking action uh, to enforce the current rules as well, and I was extremely concerned to hear of certain disposable vaping products that don't adhere to our regulatory standards. There's been a particular issue about the Chinese-made Elf Bar. Working closely with the MHRA in trading standards, we've agreed a voluntary withdrawal of some of these products from the UK market. And some large supermarkets like Tesco are already setting a good example by working across their distribution network and ensuring all their products meet the requirements. I urge the rest of the retail sector and vape manufacturers to follow suit and to obey our current vaping rules. If they don't do this, it could result in an unlimited fine. Companies failing to comply with the law will be held accountable. And to that end today, I can announce that we will go further to enforce the rules. Working hand in glove with uh, enforcement agencies and learning from our work with trading standards on illicit tobacco, we'll provide three million of new funding to create a specialized flying squad to enforce the rules on vaping and tackle illicit vapes and underage sales. This national program will help share knowledge and intelligence across regional networks, including on organised crime gangs. It will bolster training and enforcement, uh, and enforcement capacity in trading standards and undertake specific projects such as test purchasing in convenience stores and vape shops. We will produce guidance to help build regulatory compliance and we will remove illegal products <coughs> from shelves and at our borders and we will undertake more testing to ensure compliance with our rules. But... While we want to make sure that children don't take up vaping, vaping can play an important role in helping the government to achieve its smoke-free 2030 ambition, because vaping is effectively a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we don't want children to develop an addiction to any substance at a young age. But on the other hand, for adults, vaping is substantially less harmful than smoking. And we now have high-quality evidence from Oxford University that compared to nicotine gum or patches, Vapes are significantly more effective as a quit tool 
but not more hazardous. And that is particularly true when they're combined with additional behavioural support from local stop smoking services. Vaping is already uh, estimated to contribute to about 50 to 70,000 additional smoking quits per year in England, showing the potential power of it as a tool. However, vapes are not currently being widely used enough to fulfil their full potential as smoking quit aids. Now, a, stop, a swap to stop uh, partnership is a scheme where smokers are provided with a free uh, vape starter kit alongside behavioural support to help them completely uh, stop smoking. And there have already been successful local pilots of swap to stop schemes in many areas, including Bath, Southampton, Sheffield and Plymouth. And learning from these proven effective pilots, today I'm delighted to announce that we will be funding a new national swap to stop scheme, the first of its kind in the world. Uh, we will work with councils and others to offer a million smokers across England a free vaping starter kit. Smokers who join this scheme, uh, which will initially run over two years, must join on one condition, uh, that they commit to quit smoking with support. For our part, we will make it as easy as possible, referring people to stop smoking services and also developing a digital uh, approach to help people quit smoking. And once that's done, we'll also offer people support to quit vaping as well. So quit smoking, then also quit vaping. We will target the most at-risk communities first, focusing on settings such as job centres, homeless centres and social housing providers. And we want to work with retailers on this journey too. Among the first of these exciting projects will be in the North East. Uh, we've already been working with local councils in Northumberland, Gateshead, South Tyneshead and Hartlepool to start a joined up delivery of swap to stop schemes in their most deprived neighbourhoods. And this scheme represents an exciting opportunity to capitalise on the potential of vaping as a tool to help smokers quit. Uh, the latest international research shows that smokers who use a vape every day are three times more likely to quit smoking. Interestingly, even if they didn't intend to quit smoking. So, we will offer a million smokers uh, new help to quit. But let me turn to some of the other ways that we'll uh, uh, take steps to help people stop smoking and start quitting. Uh, let me start with our next steps on uh, illicit and uh, underage sales. Taking action against those who break the rules, uh, firstly, protects legitimate shops from being undercut. But we also know it's very important to stop uh, underage uh, smoking because illicit tobacco and underage sales are very, very strongly linked. And we've already implemented a new successful new UK-wide system of track and trace for cigarettes and hand rolling tobacco to deter illicit sales. And this system requires all cigarettes and hand rolling tobacco to be tracked right from the manufacturer to the first retailer using unique ID codes applied to the products. Track and trace will be extended to all tobacco products in May 2024. This means it will not only track cigarettes and hand rolling tobacco, but also cigars, cigarillos, shisha and other tobacco. Operation CC, which is a UK-wide intelligence hub between HMRC and National Trading Standards, has also bolstered our efforts against illicit tobacco, and we've given it long-term funding. Operation CC uh, resulted in more than 7 million worth of illegal tobacco products being removed from sale in its first year and prevented far more illegal activity as well. HMRC uh, introducing tougher additional sanctions uh, to track and trace to defer repeat attending, uh, including a new civil penalty of up to £10,000 for more serious offences. I can also announce that this year HMRC and Border Force will be publishing an updated strategy to tackle illicit tobacco and it will lay out strategically how we continue to target, catch and punish those involved in the illicit tobacco market. Now if you supply tobacco for sale in the UK you must be registered for Tobacco Track and Trace and also obtain an economic operator ID and we want to use this existing system in a new way uh, to help strengthen enforcement and to target the illicit market. So from now on where people are found uh, selling illicit tobacco we will seize their products, we will remove their economic operator ID, and they will no longer be able to buy or sell tobacco. We're also exploring how to share information with local partners about who is registered on the track and trace system, so they know who is and who isn't legally entitled to sell tobacco in their local areas, further helping to drive enforcement. Now, of course, some would go much further uh, to stop people smoking in the first place. The Khan Review last year advocated the New Zealand approach, a full phase out of smoking, with the age of sale increasing over time to cover all adults. 
Now, that would be a major departure from the policy pursued over recent decades, which has emphasised a personal responsibility and help for people to quit. And it is the help for current smokers to quit that we want to focus on. And there is much more that we can do to help people quit smoking. Over half of all smokers, that's three million people, want to quit smoking. And one million of these people want to quit in the next three months. But nicotine is highly, highly addictive. And we know that 95% of unsupported quit attempts uh, relapse within a year. So we will do more to help people uh, quit. First, we'll use the latest treatments, proven to give smokers a much uh, greater chance of quitting. And some of the most cost-effective treatments that we have are currently not available in England. So we're working closely with suppliers to give access to prescribers to put licensed medications in the hand of those who would benefit the most from them. For example, ensuring the availability <coughs> of proven smoking cessation medicines um, for, such as uh, uh, verine, verineclin, say this right, and cysticine. Cyst, <laughs> cysticine. I'm going to check with the CMO whether I'm saying these things right. Um, um, uh, and, uh, we've been working urgently with business to try and unblock supply chain problems to support more people who want to quit. Um, second, we'll join up services through the new integrated care systems to make the NHS more like a national prevention service. And the pioneering work that's being done by the Humber and North Yorkshire Integrated Care Board is leading the way in devoting local health service resources, organising the local system to have a local voice in driving down smoking rates in their most deprived communities. In April this month, they will go live with their comprehensive tobacco control programme. Uh, they will go first in implementing many of our national plans, including the provisions of incentives for pregnant women to stop smoking, providing uh, vapes as a first-line quit aid, lung health screening, and joining up local services to tackle illicit tobacco. And I encourage all ICBs to follow their example and develop similar local partnerships with local authorities to create effective tobacco control programmes. It's a really good example of the potential power of integrated care systems to bring everything together and bring the full resources of the local health system together to drive prevention. Third, the third big thing that we will do to, to help people quit is to help pregnant women quit. Nationally, about 9% of women still smoke in pregnancy, and it's, but it affects as many as nearly one in four births in some areas. And of course, smoking in pregnancy increases the risk of stillbirth, miscarriage and sudden infant death. All maternity services in England are establishing pathways to ensure rapid access uh, to stop smoking support for all pregnant women. We've already rolled out a carbon monoxide testing widely to mothers. Recently, financial incentive schemes have been proving effective to reduce the number of pregnant women uh, smoking and reduce the number successfully quitting. Uh, in trials, women receiving financial incentives are more than twice as likely to quit, and the return on investment from these schemes is about four pounds for every one pound invested. These schemes have been effective in a number of local areas, including Greater Manchester, which has seen the biggest drop in maternal smoking rates over the last two years. So today we build on that local evidence on those successful proven effective schemes, and today I'm announcing that we will offer a financial incentive scheme to all pregnant women who smoke by the end of next year. This will unlock a lifetime of benefits for both the child and the mother. Fourth, we will uh, provide further help for people with mental health conditions to quit. Smoking is more than twice as high among people living with mental health issues, and they will die 10 to 20 years earlier, and the biggest factor in that is smoking. It's a common misconception that, helping, uh, that smoking helps with anxiety. Actually, smoking exacerbates anxiety and depression, and quitting smoking has been uh, proven to be as effective as taking antidepressants. So we'll work with mental health services to improve signposting to evidence-based support for smokers. At a minimum, all mental health practitioners will be able to provide signposting to specially developed, evidence-based uh, digital quit resources. Fifth, uh, to help people quit, we will use a new approach to health warnings. The front of cigarette packs uh, has contained smoking kills warnings since 1991. And we will continue this, but we also want to give people hope and connect them in a hassle-free way to the best offer of support. So we'll consult this year on introducing mandatory cigarette pack inserts with positive messages and information to help people quit. In Canada, health-promoting inserts are required by law and have been in place since 2000. Evidence from the experience in Canada 
shows that pack inserts are an effective measure to increase the number of people attempting to quit smoking. And we've commissioned the University of Stirling to undertake testing with UK adult smokers and young people to help get this right. We're exploring how best we can use innovative, innovative approaches uh, within this, such as the use of QR codes to make it as easy as possible for people to get help to quit. You could take a picture with your phone of QR code and be taken straight to stop smoking support, uh, including swap to stop schemes of the kind that I've been talking about in this speech. So uh, in conclusion, the evidence is overwhelming that stopping smoking not only has major uh, health, but also economic benefits. It's crucial to extending healthy life expectancy, particularly leveling up the places where it's lowest. And that is why today we are taking action to stop working, vaping on children, introducing new help for a million smokers to quit, increasing enforcement of illicit sales, expanding access to new treatments, backing new joined up uh, integrated approaches, ruling out a national incentive scheme to help pregnant women quit, uh, consulting on new pack inserts using modern technology, all different ways to help people quit. And these proposals to reach our goal of a smoke-free 2030 are some of the most innovative in the world. They will give people, more people, the help that they need to quit smoking for good. And I thank you, uh, all of you, the wonderful experts in this room today, for all of your ideas that have gone into this speech, all of your help, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. There's an enormous amount there for us to get our, our teeth into, and so I'm keen not to abuse my privileged chair at all and to turn to the expertise in the room. So if we turn to maybe a couple of questions in the room, and then I really am keen to turn to our online audience, given there's so many people um, online today. So, so do start to formulate those questions. Perhaps if we go to this gentleman here in the, in the second row, first and foremost. And our only house rule here is that you must state your name and organisation uh, before asking your questions. So, over to you. Hopefully not treading the teeth up as well. <laughs> um, thanks very much, Minister. Uh, my name's Sean Walsh. I am from Cancer Research UK. Um, I think there are some really good welcome steps in what you've outlined today um, that picked up on recommendations from the, the previous review. I guess we would want to encourage you to turn those steps into giant leaps. Uh, especially if we want to achieve smoke-free by 2030. And I'm interested in your reflections on one of the recommendations in the review about increasing age of sale um, and whether that's something that you feel is something the government would still like to pursue. So in consulting on increasing the age of sale and what we can do as a sector to help nudge you, move you, encourage you in that direction. There is public support for this. Over 70% of the public support it. There was a Times poll only a few months ago where 82% of the of Times readers supported uh, raising the age of sale on the purchase of tobacco and cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Well, firstly, um, thank you for all the work that you do at Cancer Research. It's uh, an amazing organisation, uh, saving lots of lives. Um, on age of sale, I, I, I tried to flag in my speech. Uh, we think that's uh, too big a departure from uh, uh, the policy we've been following for many decades, which is of uh, helping people to quit rather than banning adults from buying cigarettes. So that's not something we're going to pursue. Instead, we want to major on measures to help people uh, quit smoking uh, rather than do that. Thank you. And there's a hand that's been up the, the whole whole time uh, back there. So can I go to the, the lady in the probably second or third from back? Just there. Yeah, that's, that's the correct. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, thank you. Um, and thanks, Neil. That was a great announcement. We've been waiting since July 2019 when the government first announced its Smoke Free 2030 ambition for concrete proposals to take this forward. And we've finally seen them today. And they are, as you say, innovative. Um, but I'm afraid they don't go quite far enough. So um, when you spoke in Parliament on, um, the no, in the No Smoking Day debate, you said that smoking would also be central to the major conditions strategy, mm -hmm. uh, which is absolutely essential because smoking causes all the major conditions mm -hmm. from cancer to cardiovascular disease to chronic respiratory disease, from dementia to diabetes, from mental health problems to mm -hmm. musculoskeletal disorders. So can you confirm that you will be able to announce further um, proposals to take us to Smoke Free 2030 ask you just to, um, yeah. in the... Um, uh, major conditions strategy and that there will be more funding because the funding that's been announced so, so far is nowhere near the 125 million recommended um, by the government's independent, just own very, independent. Yeah. Yeah. Very quickly, can you just say your name and organisation? Sorry, I'm Deborah Arnott from Action on Smoking and Health. Thank you. Um, 
so Deborah, um, uh, several things. I mean, first, uh, thank you for all the work that Ash has done over a very long period. I quoted from a, a 2010 uh, policy exchange report, and I, I seem to remember that you had quite an important role in, in that report. So thank you for, for providing the evidence base for a lot of the uh, measures that we've uh, uh, announcing today. To take your last um, uh, question first, I can confirm that the, the, the schemes that I've announced today, the extra uh, help to help uh, give free vet kits to a million smokers, the universal uh, sp uh, support and incentives to help um, people quit in pregnancy. That is uh, 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 additional funding. It's not coming out of the public health um, uh, grant. I mean, uh, the public health grants in total are going up by about 5% over the next um, two years, if you include uh, uh, the various funds, like the drugs fund and um, <coughs> no, the measures that we're taking on uh, the early years. Um, absolutely, of course, be, uh, quite rightly, you will say, because it's your job to always say we should be going further, and we are, of course, thinking as we think about the major conditions, you are completely right that it is a huge contributor to every one of those major conditions. So uh, we will absolutely be thinking about what the health service can do and what, what more we can do. This is, um, I think there is a, uh, important steps towards our goal of 2030 today, but it's, of course, never the end of the story. Thank you very much. Um, just while you're raising your hands in the room, I'm keen to turn to a couple of questions from the online audience. Um, so first and foremost, uh, Paul Baker, uh, if you can hear us and... Uh, Take yourself off mute. Please just introduce yourself with uh, uh, the organisation that you're representing and hopefully we can, can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, hello there. Sorry. Uh, Paul Baker, I'm from Anankar's Easy Way. Uh, I think it's a very, very positive step that you've announced today. Um, we've obviously been looking for it for quite a few years. But the one comment I've got is that obviously vaping is expensive for the user, particularly in this cost of living crisis that we're going through at the moment as well as being addictive. Um, I'm just wondering why in the announcements you're, you're not including a nice approved drug-free method of stopping smoking as well. Uh, you, you are right, vaping does cost money. It's obviously preferable if people have a choice to not do either. Uh, where vaping comes in is as a stop smoking uh, tool uh, and in moving from uh, smoking to vaping, people still do make a huge saving. They'll save even more if they do neither, of course, but there's still a very large saving every year for people from moving from smoking to vaping, and that's just one of the many benefits. Obviously, the biggest one is in, in saving people's health. Uh, while it's not completely risk-free, uh, I was on the Science and Technology Committee when we uh, did a big uh, dig into this, uh, and um, uh, OHID and PHE have done further work since, and it is about 95% safer than smoking, so moving from uh, smoking to vaping uh, is a huge improvement, uh, even though, of course, we want people to not do either in the longer term. Thank you very much. Uh, John Ely, if you can uh, hear us um, online, if you could take yourself off mute um, and ask your question. Hello, John Ely from The Mail Online. I have two questions. First one is, will the Swap to Stop scheme be expanded to all smokers, including underage and pregnant smokers? And what measures will be included to help people quit vaping once they have moved on from uh, smoking to vaping. So I should have mentioned in the speech, uh, together with the um, uh, free vaping kit and the support to stop smoking, it will always come with an offer to then also help uh, quit vaping in the longer term, because of course we want people in the ideal world not to do either of them. And in terms of the scheme itself, we'll be setting out in more detail how that will work. We'll be partnering with local partners, local authorities, social housing providers, uh, in order to, to provide that huge number of um, uh, vape kits, that huge amount of help to people to stop smoking. Uh, I do think that uh, where we've had these local schemes, the effectiveness of them has been very, very high. If I think about the one in Salford, they managed to follow up with about two thirds of the people who'd been on it, and of them about two thirds nearly had quit, uh, which is fantastic. So it is a very powerful tool uh, to potentially help people, a lot of people quit smoking. Thank you. We'll just do one more from the online audience for now, and then we'll, we'll come back to you. So can we go to um, Derris uh, Pragnall from Oxfordshire uh, County Council, if you can hear us? OK, OK, we'll go, we'll go to someone else. Penny Steed from Whittington NHS Trust. Can you, can you hear us? Do come off mute and, and ask your question. Can you hear us, Penny? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting us to this launch. It's much appreciated. 
I, I do work for Whittington Health, but actually I run a local stop smoking service, Smoke Free City in Hackney. We're a great service. We help a lot of people. We really do help them. They tend to go back to smoking and we help them again. All I wanted to say was the guy from Cancer Research UK talking about increasing the age of sale and the New Zealand model, that would be so fantastic because the people we speak to say, what makes a difference is the government actually making it impossible for them to smoke. So banning smoking in pubs, that made a huge difference to people quitting. There is only so much help you can give with an addictive substance like nicotine. So I just wanted to say, you know, from the sort of, um, what do you call it, from the coal face, please do something about raising the age of sale because I don't think health is going to cut it. Thank you. That's me done. <laughs> Thank you. It's probably more an observation than a, than a question, but you've, you've heard the tenor of what I've said and our focus is, is very much on helping people to, to quit what you quite rightly say is, is a highly addictive substance. If we go right to the back, as a lady, just to make it easy for my colleague handing out the mic. So if you could introduce yourself, your name and organisation, please. Hi, uh, Elizabeth from Cancer Research UK. Um, it's really welcome to see the new funding announced and all the signposting to stop smoking services. However, we know that those aren't universally available across the country, so some smokers won't be able to access those important services. Um, do you have any more funding for stop smoking services? And also, if the government didn't want to make the taxpayer pay, they could put a um, fund on the industry using industry funds, but without any of their interference. Uh, so you will be unsurprised to hear me say, as a, as a former ex-Treasury uh, SPAD, that of course tax announcements are for the Chancellor, mm -hmm. something drilled into you with extreme force <laughs> at the Treasury uh, and elsewhere. Um, so I'm afraid I can't comment on, um, uh, on future action, um, although we have hugely increased uh, duty rates on, uh, on cigarettes, and that is one of the things that has risen down uh, smoking rates from 20% uh, to 13% since 2010. It has been uh, a very effective lever uh, to do that. Um, uh, but on your point about the uh, stop smoking services, um, the funding for the additional vapes will be borne by us centrally rather than um, uh, locally. We ought to partner with uh, local partners and, and want to use that as a way of catalyzing um, action locally on stop smoking. And the, the point I was making about uh, uh, getting ICBs to all have a kind of plan on uh, tobacco is also an opportunity to fill in some of those gaps that you quite rightly raised there. Um, by working across an entire health system uh, to have a kind of joined up approach and get some economies of scale as well, potentially as well. So I do think that what they're uh, doing in North Yorkshire and Amberside is very, very exciting. I think if others uh, uh, look at that, they'll also want to do the same thing. Thank you. If we take another question, perhaps if we go to this um, lady in the middle, sort of on the second with the, with the black dress, and that's it. Hi, Can you say um, your name and organisation first, please? Yeah, Thank you. Uh, Carolyn Wickware from the Pharmaceutical Journal. Um, fewer than half of community pharmacies are currently offering the NHS uh, smoking cessation service. What are your plans to make this service more accessible to patients across the country? So you will have heard the Secretary of State uh, talk at the dispatch box about our forthcoming uh, primary care uh, recovery plan. Uh, and he's mentioned his enthusiasm about getting um, pharmacists doing more. Uh, it wouldn't be right for me to say more at this point. That plan is um, uh, forthcoming in the not too distant future. Uh, but absolutely we recognise the potential uh, power of pharmacy in all this. Uh, indeed, some of those local um, uh, schemes that I've mentioned have been using, as you know, uh, pharmacies as the delivery vehicle. So I think there is potential there. Today is not the day to talk about them, sadly, but um, uh, absolutely recognise the potential that's there. Thank you. Uh, if we just go, in fact, actually, the, the um, uh, colleague just sort of in front in the middle, the gentleman just here in the middle. Thanks. Name and organisation first, please. Thank you. Adam Briggs at the Health Foundation. Um, so it's great to hear the new messages and we appreciate the support for people who wanted to quit. Um, the message that national government isn't going to want to do more to stop people from starting to smoke in the first place is loud and clear. What opportunities might there be in the future for local government to do more to stop people smoking, particularly increasing their ability to create smoke-free places for families and young people? Oh, so we're very keen on uh, innovation um, uh, by local government. Uh, keen on them uh, doing more uh, as part of those kind of ICS level plans that uh, I've talked about, um, thinking about how they can drive enforcement. There's lots of different things that local government uh, can do in this speech. Of effectively, we're picking up a bunch of things that have been innovated, uh, innovated uh, locally, and I hope that they will continue to do that. So I'm um, keen to discuss further. 
If we just go for one more uh, for now, if we go to this gentleman in the corner, and then there's a few people who have had their hands up for a while. Hopefully we'll come to you in a second after the online question. We should have time. Uh, name an organisation first, please, sir. Uh, Fraser Knight from LBC Radio. Um, I just want to ask you a little bit more about the flying squad, I think mm. you called them, uh, mm. to crack down on, on illicit vapes and mm. underage sales. And um, how will that work? Will it be sort of one central team? Are you planning to have you know, several teams who will be in charge mm. of it? Uh, and you also talked about, you know, there's, there's a bit of a difference between stopping illicit vapes mm. from coming into the country, but mm -hmm. also cracking down on underage sales. Which are you more worried about? Where do you want to see more focus being put on? Is it mm. those manufacturers who don't follow the rules or is it the, the, the retailers who are selling them mm. every day to underage kids? I've heard the, the boring answer um, to the last question is both of them. We obviously need to crack down on, on both of those things, which are, are serious problems. Um, the role of the, um, uh, the new uh, central unit is to uh, join up what's happening locally. Obviously, trading standards, quite rightly, is a local service with local uh, intel. But there is a role for a centralised um, team because some of these issues go right across the supply chain from things are either picked up because uh, they're being sold in a shop or they're being sold, picked up at the border and we need to have uh, intelligence moving around the system um, uh, uh, more freely as well as just providing a bit more additional resource on top of what's there already um, in terms of enforcement and mystery shopping and going into places and um, uh, seeing if people are uh, selling them illegally to, to young people. I think that's quite, quite an important part of it as well. So we do, I'm afraid it, the boring answer is we want to crack down on all these different things. I have been very, very concerned, even just locally as a constituency MP, about what appears to be a very rapid run-up about uh, vaping among young people. Uh, CMO has expressed his concerns about it. Um, uh, and so that is why we're creating this uh, central unit to build on what's happening locally. Thank you. So if we just go for um, a couple of questions from the online audience and hopefully we'll have some time for those who still want to ask questions in the room. So if we go first to um, Robin Stevens, if you can come off um, mute, hopefully you can hear us. Um, just please state uh, your name and the organisation that you're, um, you're from first and foremost. Can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Hi, Robin Stevens from the Stroke Association. I wondered what role do you see the voluntary sector playing in helping to achieve smoke free 2030? Uh, great question. So I think um, I'm very, very interested in talking further about this because um, uh, I think it will be really important, um, particularly for this um, uh, central um, swap to stop scheme to partner with local organisations. That's the only way we're going to uh, reliably uh, get um, this kit and these opportunities into the hands of uh, smokers who need them. Uh, so very, very keen to explore what we can do, not just with local authorities or uh, not just with uh, social housing providers, but with uh, other local organisations as well, um, some of whom will have um, uh, fantastic local insights and, and we'll be able to work very creatively with. So very continue, keen to continue this conversation after meeting, if that's right. Thank you very much. Uh, next online is Jacob Freeman. Jacob, if you can come off, off mute and say um, where you're uh, calling in from today, that'd be appreciated. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Uh, we can, loud and clear. Okay, uh, my name's Jacob and I work for Smoke Free Sefton. Um, my question was just regarding vapes, really, um, and whether there was any um, plans to implement the track and trace system for, uh, for vapes as well as the smoke tobacco ah, yeah. so the, the track and trace system sp is specifically for um, tobacco but the reason why um, uh, we're creating this central enforcement um, team is exactly because there are um, supply chain wide um, uh, examples uh, we've already seen I talked about in the speech the elf bar example um, uh, uh, and we do need to have a uh, greater join up uh, between what we're doing at the border and what we're doing locally hence the creation of that um, uh, that centralised team to, to pool intelligence across different agencies. Uh, so that's the, that's the kind of the logic underlying that. Thank you. And then just one more question from our online audience, and hopefully we'll have time for you here in the room. So um, uh, Douglas uh, Mutter, if you can hear us, come off mute and say where you're coming from. Do ask a question. Yeah, can you hear me, guys? Uh, yeah, we yes, can. we can. Just hear you. Uh, uh, Doug Mutter from GPZ, the UK's largest retailer um, for vaping products. Um, question is around, uh, well, two, obviously the, the big issue on illicit and underage sales. Um, there are proposals around that that bring in licensing to sell vaping products, um, which requires age verification and training to do so. 
Um, there are suggestions there that have been put forward. Just wondering if the Minister will um, engage with industry on this and look how we can accelerate this further to remove the illegal sale of underage, pro uh, to underage uh, children. I'm very keen to work with industry because I know a lot of people in the industry are uh, as concerned as I am about uh, underage sales, sale of illegal products uh, and so forth. So we're very, very keen to work with the industry to try and um, uh, make the most of vaping as a quick tool, but at the same time uh, stamp out um, some of the bribe practice uh, from some less reputable suppliers and uh, some less reputable retailers as well. So very keen to continue that conversation with industry, absolutely. I'm going to do one more online and then um, I will be able to squeeze a couple in, I hope. So, John uh, Foster, if you can uh, uh, hear us and um, come off mute and let us know where you're calling from uh, today and do ask your question. John, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, uh, loud and clear. So, yes, so John Foster from Asthma and Lung UK. Um, I'm just reflecting on uh, to the independent review last year, um, found that we were, I think, on target to miss the 23 target by seven years um, and they obviously came forward with a very comprehensive um, set of recommendations in order to turn that trend around. Um, the recommendations today, while obviously very welcome, do fall quite a long way short from um, Javid Khan's recommendations. So I just wanted to ask the Minister how confident he is that today's recommendations will now mean that we hit 2030 target by 2030. Yeah, so I mean the steps that we're taking today, the additional funding for uh, quitting smoking in pregnancy, the additional uh, funding uh, for swap to stop, the things we're doing on pack inserts, uh, and the additional um, uh, things we're doing to try and stop people starting in the first place, I think will have a substantive impact and they will affect a huge number of people. In fact, it's a, uh, a substantive programme that we are going to have to run to deliver all this uh, quickly over the next two years. So I do think they will make a substantive impact. As I've said before in questions, it's not the end of the story and uh, never say that these are the final measures we'll take. Um, uh, but we will continue to drive down smoking. What we've been doing, um, although smoking is still too high, has made a big difference. I have uh, already mentioned about going from 20% smoking in uh, 2010 to 13% now. We want it to be uh, lower still, but we can continue to drive it down. Definitely, thank you. So a couple of questions in the room, perhaps. If we go to that lady on the, in the, kind of in the middle there, and then we go to this gentleman here in the, in the aisle who's waited very patiently. Thank you. Uh, Anne McNeil from King's College London. I want to thank you for the statement. Um, uh, it is certainly long overdue, but I wanted to ask about mass media campaigns, which are known to be one of the most effective tools uh, for keeping awareness of the unique dangers of smoking in the public eye, but also for encouraging quit attempts and signposting mm. support. Uh, Javed Khan had recommended that around 50 million a year should be spent on such campaigns. I understand that it's around or less than a million that's been spent in the last year. So I wonder if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, so there's, there's always more things that we can spend money on. And one of the striking things about being a minister in Department of Health is although the health budget is very large, um, there's always more things, more good things one can spend money on. And in choosing what uh, to spend our money on here, we've tried to go with things that have a really, really strong evidential base. Um, and the reason we've uh, gone with the smoking and pregnancy thing is because of very, very striking gold, gold standard evidence that that has been very effective. Uh, in places like Greater Manchester, the reason for the uh, swap to stop things is again really striking evidence that it's very, very effective pound for pound. Of course, there is always um, uh, more that one can do in all of these things, um, but uh, those things that we have funded and the, the uh, enforcement um, uh, team um, are, are, I think, very well evidence uh, driven. Uh, and I think, as part of uh, how we roll these things out, I am keen that we generate maximum publicity. I mean, very struck even just in the run-up to speech bow, talking about doing things uh, about this does galvanise a public conversation, does remind everyone of the dangers of um, uh, smoking and the need to, to drive it down. And as part of working with local partners, local I ICBs and ICSs, I do want us to try and publicise uh, 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 what we're doing and, uh, and continue to pump out that kind of anti-smoking uh, message. I want to try and use the consultation on youth vaping, in fact, to try and stimulate a conversation about these things among uh, younger people um, and indeed in some of the places where they are doing effective local kind of stop smoking campaigns that kind of comms bit is certainly a, a strong part of it so it's it is important but um, uh, we recognize there's always more one could do and more one can spend but uh, we've tried to pick things that are strongly evidence-based 
and this, I think, will have to be the final question from the, the agenda. That's, yeah. Name an organisation, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, Nick Hopkinson from uh, Imperial College London and uh, Ash as well. Um, so the Minister will be aware that a, a polluter pays levy on tobacco industry profits um, implemented through the existing NHS pricing scheme and, and capping uh, tobacco industry profits in UK sales at 10% would bring £700 million directly into the Department of Health. And this is five times, five times more than the cost of fully implementing the Khan report. Um, the, uh, the Chief Medical Officer has described the tobacco industry uh, business model as killing people for profit. So my, my question straightforwardly is, is why is the government allowing the industry to keep this money while at the same time bringing forward piecemeal and uh, inadequate proposals to deal with smoking and deliver smoking 20, smoke for 2030? So I'm afraid the, the boring response is the one I gave before, which is that uh, everything to do with uh, taxes and revenues is to do with uh, Treasury, it's for them to make these decisions. Like, I think you should, uh, I'm really familiar with the work that you um, are talking about. Indeed, uh, Henry Featherstone, who was involved in that policy exchange report that I mentioned, has been advocating this for a while, and uh, I know that you've worked it up in some detail. So all I can do is uh, you make, your case to, make your case to the Treasury, and um, I'm sure that they will uh, listen with interest, but it's not really for me to set out today, I'm afraid. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've rattled through um, our time um, this, this afternoon, so it just remains for me to say um, thank you very much to all of you for, for your questioning, which hopefully touches upon lots of the areas that the Minister has set out, and indeed to our online audience for their fantastic questions, and do, uh, do engage with the consultation um, eight-week time horizon to um, submit to that and your views. And thank you very, very much to all of you for coming to Policy Exchange today. Please do join me in thanking the Minister. <laughs>